on August 4th, uh, August 1st, that is this Thursday, we will begin another month of study out of the book, 28 Days Walking Daily with the Lord. And as we get ready for that, as is always the case, I am trying to make sure to remind you as that comes up that you get ready for another month of study and what we're going to specifically do with that particular month of study. In the month of August, we are going to be examining the topic, Triumphing Over Sin. And if you will, turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And I want us to take a look at this passage of Scripture that really sets the stage for our lesson this morning. 1 John chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. 1 John chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. John writes the following regarding sin and the temptation to sin. He says, I have written to you fathers because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. When John writes this letter, he is writing this letter to a group of Christians, people who were familiar with God, and that's why he says up front, you know who it is that we're talking about. So that being the case, don't love the world. Now, that doesn't mean do not love God's creation. God's creation is a blessing in and of itself to us. We have a beautiful world in which we live. Blue skies, blue oceans, mountain ranges, if you're from that part of the country. We live in a beautiful world, but the world itself, regard, in, in regard to man, and in regard to what man has done in that world, is a sinful place. And when we talk about worldliness, we're not talking about something positive. We are talking about something that is most definitely negative in regard to the lusts that are out there and how we give in to those lusts. So right up front, he says, don't love the things that are in the world. Don't, don't love worldliness. Don't love the temptations that are present around us that lead us to sin and lead us away from God. Because if we are going to have fellowship with God, then we cannot have fellowship with the world. And so he reminds those first century Christians, as we are reminded today of the ways that we might be tempted to sin. He talks about those three ways very familiar to us, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. The same three temptations that were presented to Eve in the Garden of Eden, the same three temptations that were presented to Jesus when he was tempted in the wilderness. The difference is that Eve and Adam, like so many of us, give in to those temptations and Jesus resisted. And Jesus resisted through the power of the Word of God. So this morning, as we get ready for another month of 28 days of focused study, this one being with triumphing over sin, it's very important that we analyze what sin is so that we can know it and recognize it when it's presenting itself at our doorstep so that we can know it and flee from it when it's coming our way. Let's take a look at some things this morning about how we can triumph over sin and recognizing just exactly what sin is. First and foremost, sin is deceptive of sin. Realize that in our world today, we have a major religious belief that is present, a belief that says you cannot fall away from your relationship with God. You may have heard the term once saved, always saved. You may have heard the idea that you cannot fall from God's grace. Both of these concepts are entirely foreign to the Bible. 
In fact, the Hebrews writer here is writing once again, just like John, to a Christian audience, to those who have put on Jesus Christ in baptism. And he warns those children of God to be careful to take care that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Brethren, you cannot fall from something that you do not first have. And I've heard some people say, well, they really weren't Christians in the first place. The text identifies them as such. And to these children of God, he says, be careful that you do not fall away from God. Be careful that although you have been saved by the blood of the Lamb, be careful that you do not return to the deceitfulness of sin that once had mastery over you and are hardened by its temptation. Just as sure as somebody can leave sin and come up out of the waters of baptism excited about being a new creation in Christ, excited about the prospects that lie ahead, excited about living their life to glorify God and to share that glory with others. Just as sure as that can happen, there are people who can abandon that excitement and once again go back into the sin of the world. Why? Well, maybe because they are comfortable with it. Maybe because they didn't realize what they were giving up. And maybe because it promises things that it really just cannot deliver. I can remember all those times that my dad would walk into an adult class and say, raise your hands if you like to sin. And nobody wanted to raise their hands because that sounds like the wrong thing to say. He said, then why do you do it? You see, sin can be enjoyable in the moment. Sin can promise joy and happiness, but yet never deliver, certainly not on the eternal scale. And brethren, if we're making decisions in this life, in this short life, in this time that the Bible describes as a, just a twinkling of the eye, something that is ever so brief and fleeting compared to the everlasting existence of eternity, then we're making the wrong decisions. We have to think beyond the here and now, and we have to be mindful of the there and then. Sin makes wrong look right. It makes ugly look attractive. It makes slavery look like liberty. It makes misery look satisfying. And it makes death look like life. But brethren, remember, Satan is not an angel. He may masquerade as an angel of light, but he is no messenger from God. He is a messenger of death and eternal destruction. Number two, sin is debilitating. Let me have you turn to Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 to get an idea of what we're talking about here. There's a description that is given to us in a passage that I like to liken to running the Christian race. And it's this idea that if we're going to run the race and run the race successfully, one of the first things that we have to do is we have to free ourselves from the things that would entangle us, would ensnare us and keep us from running successfully. You can only imagine what it would be like to run a race with your feet tied together. If you've ever been in a uh, a, a three-legged race with somebody, you realize that when you share those legs and you share somebody else, it's sometimes kind of hard to get your rhythm. Well, it would be even harder if both of your legs are tied together. How in the world are you going to proceed? Some people view that as the norm because sin has deceived them. But what Jesus wants us to understand is how free we are in him and how necessary it is to be free in him to run this race successfully. The Hebrews writer again says in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 12, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us very easy for sin to entangle us to encircle us to surround us and sometimes we do not realize just exactly how debilitating it is to our lives sin help keeps us from being who we need to be it keeps us from being what we need to be 
and it keeps us from going where we need to go. And so much like people who have vision problems but don't realize it, we need our eyes fixed so that we can see where we are and we can escape that entanglement. It's interesting that if you've ever been able to see very clearly and you have cataracts, that is something that is very debilitating. But unlike most, if you'll remember when I had cataracts a, a year or so ago, it was a rare form of cataract in that one morning I woke up and one of my eyes was just blind. And very quickly the other one progressed to the point that I was having a very difficult time seeing. It was nearly impossible for me to read. Uh, if I wanted to get up to something, I had to hold it very close to my right eye. And it kind of looked very strange. Now, some people have vision that's just that bad. But instead of over a six-month time period, it's developed over a 10-year time period, maybe 15-year time period. It's so slow and it's so gradual that they just think that that's how it's supposed to be. And that's how sin is. Not only is it deceptive in that we sometimes don't identify it surrounding us, but it is so debilitating that we're just kind of used to dealing with it and we don't know how much better it would be if we could free ourselves from its entanglement. So, brethren, let us realize that sin is debilitating, and we want to do all that we can to free ourselves from its clutches. Certainly, I think you would agree with me that sin is destructive. If you take a look at the book of 1 Corinthians, and you'll notice that's not verses 1 through 16, that's all 16 chapters of the book of 1 Corinthians, you'll see how destructive sin is. In that, pa in that particular book, you not only see passages of Scripture that talk about the destructiveness that sin has to our own bodies, but to the home, to the church, to a community or a nation. It was destroying the church at Corinth. Uh, they were on their way from falling from that grace that had been extended to them uh, by God. And so Paul writes them to warn them, to warn them about the problems that they're facing and to warn them and say, do you not understand that you are divided, which is contrary to God's will? Do you not realize that you are not only have people living in open immorality, but you're condoning that, which is against God's will? Do you not understand that you are dressing, and, and as I was asked this morning in Bible class, you're wearing your hair length not according to God's plan. That's 1 Corinthians 11. You're not worshiping according to God's plan. In fact, you're being very selfish and very prideful about how you live and even how you claim to serve God. Sin was destroying the church at Corinth. We can give thanks by the time we read Paul's second letter to them that some of them have started to change and some of them have started to get back on track. But in this particular case, you've got people who are literally day by day being destroyed by the problem of sin. I want you to consider what Jesus said through John's writing in Revelation chapter 3 verses 14 through 22 regarding the church at Laodicea. There were seven churches scattered throughout Asia that are referenced in the first few chapters of, of Revelation. And it's in Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, that Jesus says the following to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, Amen. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this. That's a way of saying, Jesus says this, I know your deeds that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were hot or cold, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may become rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and I salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, therefore be zealous and repent. 
Behold, I stand and knock at the door. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Laodicea was being warned warned in a way that I think would be indicative of many congregations of the church today. There are a lot of congregations of the church that assemble on Sunday mornings just as we are doing now. They assemble at later times just as we will do then. Uh, they dress nicely. They hold their Bibles in their hands. Uh, they may even go and do other things, but yet there's still a foothold that sin has in their lives. There is still a way that it has control over them. They haven't given up complete mastery of sin to their lives, and they haven't embraced complete mastery of righteousness in their lives to Jesus Christ. They're somewhere in the middle. And we all understand what walking down the middle of the road can do to you. We all understand what riding the fence means. That's what Jesus was describing when he says, you're neither hot nor cold. Now, I just got through preaching a gospel meeting in, in Sardis, Tennessee last week. And one of the things that we talked about on one of the nights of this meeting was the idea that there are two paths that we can travel. We're talking about good versus evil, right versus wrong. We're talking about that wide path that most people will travel that leads to destruction compared to the narrow path that few will follow that leads to eternal life. We're used to seeing a dichotomy in Scripture, one versus another. And yet Jesus brings up something that I always find fascinating. He brings up a third option. A third option that really is not a third option. It's going to lead to the same destruction as those who never embrace Christianity. And yet he says it's worse off for you because you're trying to have both. And you're fooling no one. Perhaps but yourself. We've got to realize that we have to make a choice. And we can't have it both ways. We cannot have it both ways. We have to make sure that we make a choice and that that choice is sure and resolute. Let's not, let's not embrace that path that leads to destruction. Let's make the choice to give God complete control over our life, that Jesus is our master and sin has no part so that it will not destroy the relationship that we have with him and the hope that we look forward to of eternal life. I want you to also consider, based on James chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, that sin is, is divisive. Certainly, we saw that in the church at Corinth. Paul was making a point to them by saying to them, Has Christ been divided? Well, neither should we be. Well, in James chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, James writes, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Do you realize what's going on here? Once again, a New Testament letter written to children of God, but children of God who are not behaving in the right way. He says there's a reason that you have all the problems that you have. In Christ, you shouldn't have these problems. In Christ, you should have a more joyful, more peaceful life. In Christ, you shouldn't be struggling with sin like you are because you are divided in your allegiances. When that happens, James says in verse 4, you adulteresses. Now remember that adultery is the affair that exists between one married partner and someone else. Within the bond of marriage, the only relationship we should be having is husband to wife. And when one of those people, the husband or the wife, goes outside of that marriage and has a relationship, that by definition is an adulteress, or is adultery, because they're not given permission to pursue that additional relationship. They're cheating. They're not right in the sight of God. James says, you adulteresses, why? 
because they say that they're married to the Lord, they say that He is the bridegroom, the bridegroom and that we are the bride of Christ, and yet you're having an affair with the sin of the world. You're flirting with it. You're playing with it. You're embracing it. He says, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Where are our allegiances? Once again, if it's not on Christ, then it's with the world. And if it's with the world while trying to lay claim to Christ, then we will forever live a divided and unrighteous existence. Sin is also deadly, and I could say deadly in a, in a number of different ways. Uh, certainly in James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, James writes, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Now realize this, the death could be understood in a lot of different ways. The Bible talks about physical death. And if you explore Adam and Eve back in the Garden of Eden, you will understand that it was never God's intention that man die physically. But when man sinned, they were expelled from the Garden of Eden, specifically because there was another tree that was present there, the tree of life from which they could eat of its fruit and live forever. And God said, we can't handle that. We cannot allow that. So he expelled them from the garden because sin is physically deadly. But it's also spiritually deadly. I think that is probably more of what James is referencing here. And we understand that those who sin, the price that we pay, according to Romans 6.23, the price that we pay is death. And that is not just a separation from God in this life, but that is a separation from God in the life to come. That's an eternal death. And certainly we see passages of Scripture that indicate just that, that those who live unrighteous, ungodly, sinful lives, those who do not appreciate its power and its destruction, those who do not appreciate the eternal death that is brought our way, these are going to be the people who are expelled forever and ever from the presence of God. Sin is deadly. Now, I've given you five reasons that there are problems, but I want you to consider something else. Sin is defeatable. It can be overcome. It can be beaten. Jesus demonstrated time and time again how this could be accomplished. Not only in how he directly overcame Satan in the wilderness in Matthew 4 and in Luke chapter 4, but he also demonstrated time and time again when he was tested, when he was tempted by the Pharisees and the scribes and the leaders of the day trying always to track, trap him and to trick him into saying something wrong. He demonstrated time and time again that we can overcome sin and the temptation that is so alluring to us. How do we go about doing that? Well, realize this. Once again, it may just be a better understanding of what it is that we're facing. But we are not facing an undefeatable opponent. We are facing a very defeatable opponent if we simply know how to do that. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 reads, No temptation has overcome you or overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. First and foremost, in proper context, let us understand that this again is a letter that is being written to children of God. Those outside of Christ, those who are lost in sin, uh, don't even understand how to escape sin. Or if they do, they have refused to embrace it. But Paul says to the church at Corinth, in that first letter, where they're struggling with so much sin in their congregational lives, he says to them, there is a way of escape. God's provided it. There is no such sin out there 
that can force you to sin. In other words, the devil can't make you do it. Your friends can't make you do it. The world in all of its treachery and all of its deceitfulness and in all of the temptation that's around us, it cannot make you sin. If you understand that with every temptation comes a way of escape, then we realize there's always hope in every situation. Now realize that that hope may be difficult. If you have told a lie and you realize that was wrong, you gave in to temptation and you actually followed through with sin, a sin that the Bible describes in Revelation 21.8 is something that is worthy of that lake that burns with fire and brimstone you now are going to have a second temptation. The second temptation is, am I going to continue to live in that lie or am I going to come clean? And that right there is a very difficult one for people because they may have lied almost without thinking about it, but now they realize it's wrong. Now they know they need to own up to what they've done. Now they need to know, now they know that they're going to have to go to an individual or perhaps in front of an entire group of people and say, I was not truthful. I told a lie. I did wrong. I sinned. Please forgive me. And so much of the time, even though there is a way of escape, not only a way of escaping the present temptation, but a way of receiving forgiveness for the past sin, there are people who think that's just too big a hill to climb. That's just too much humiliation to face. And as such, they not only have sinned, but now they continue to live in that sin. Brethren, there's a way of escape. There's always a right way to handle things. There's always a way that pleases God. And yes, that may require some humility on our part. Yes, that may require us putting our pride in the back seat and realizing that it is more important to serve God faithfully in this life and go to heaven than it is to preserve our egos and go to hell. We want to make sure that we take advantage of that promise that God has given us, that indeed sin is defeatable. It's defeatable if we look at things from God's viewpoint, if we look at sin from His standpoint, if we realize that it is a dirty, horrible, terrible thing that can forever separate us from Him. We can defeat sin if we use God's Word, as was Jesus' example on so many occasions, and others who have defeated sin and its temptation. We can defeat sin with God's help. Why is it that passages of Scripture, like Philippians 4.13, even exist? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. If we don't believe it, and if we don't embrace it, and if we don't look to Him for help, Do you realize how hard it is to sin when you're constantly in prayer? Do you realize how hard it is to sin when you're constantly listening to God from His Word? You see, if we will fill our lives with that holiness, if we'll fill our lives with the ongoing endeavor to please our God, we'll find that not only is sin very defeatable, but God's pleasure is is easily obtained. I want you to consider for just a moment these 28 days in the month of August that we are going to put into practice some habits that are going to help us overcome sin, to be triumphant over sin. The goal is to intentionally, consistently, and successfully target a specific sin or spiritual weakness in our lives. And we're going to work Not alone, together, but most importantly with God's help to eradicate it from our lives. One of the things that I want us to understand is that each of the days that we are going to embark upon together, we need to examine ourselves to be able to honestly look at our lives and say, am I really giving God what I ought to be giving Him? Ask yourself, what am I struggling with the most? What is my most besetting sin? Or what are my problematic sins that are constantly plaguing me? Identify that number one sin that's in your life, or maybe you have a a top two. But go the effort to make sure you recognize you are not perfect in and of yourself. We all make mistakes. 
we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. So therefore, we need to be honest enough with this introspection, with this self-analysis to say, here's where I have a problem. You know, for years I've talked about certain things that other people struggle with that I don't struggle with at all. But then there are those things that they don't struggle with that to this day I have problems dealing with. I have to look at my life, not other people's lives. I have to look at my life, and I have to make sure that my calling and election is sure. Secondly, I want us to intensely pray about it each day, two or three times a day, five or six times a day. Brethren, there is no limit, no topside limit to how much we can and how much we should pray that God help us to defeat sin. Ask him, Father, please help me to do this. Uh, I cannot do it with your help. Contemplate how great God is every single day. Contemplate what he wants to do for us and what he can do for us. And as we talked about, not only is prayer beneficial in preventing sin from getting a foothold, but also reading our Bibles is important as well. And I want you to meditate upon and memorize a specific Bible verse. It doesn't have to be Esther 8 and verse 9. That's the longest verse in the Bible. It doesn't have to be John 11:35 either, the shortest verse in the Bible. But Think about some of these passages of Scripture that we're talking about today. How about memorizing that passage of Scripture that promises me that God will never let sin overcome me if I don't let it? How about I memorize that passage of Scripture that reminds me daily that there is a way of escape if I will simply look for it and follow it? Recite these verses throughout the day. Hand write them if necessary. In fact, I would even encourage it. In the school of preaching, when we assign memory verses to our students, I always encourage them to write them down several times because that is a way that we are aided in the memory process. Some of you say, I'm too old to remember anything. No, you're not. You may not remember it as well as you once did, you may not remember it as well as others, but you can remember, you can memorize passages of Scripture. Put forth the effort to do it and quote it out loud every time that you're tempted in this area. See if Jesus' pattern for our lives does not work when it's put into practice in our lives. What I want us to do, starting right now, certainly in the month of August, but even this very day, I want us to make sure that we understand just exactly how to triumph over sin. This morning, you can do that by believing the Word of God with all of your heart and putting that faith into practice. Believe that Jesus is God's Son, as Peter himself once acknowledged, uh, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Realize who He is and what He means to your life. And based upon that faith, recognize that you do sin. You have sinned. You are a sinner. I am a sinner. And as a result, we need to repent of those sins and turn from God. Remember, godly sorrow leads to repentance. But godly sorrow is being sorry that you've hurt God. Repentance is that moment in time where you stop the sin and start walking in the paths of righteousness. After you've repented of those sins, confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Much like the Ethiopian eunuch did. Much like this idea that, uh, where he said, what's preventing me from being baptized? And, and you might remember that Philip said to him, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And it was at that moment in time that Philip took him down into the water and immersed him into Christ, baptized him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why? so that you can receive the forgiveness of sins. Without baptism, you have no forgiveness of sins. So that you can be added to his church. Without baptism, you are not a member of the body of Christ. You have not been adopted into that family. So that you can be enrolled in heaven. Realize that without baptism, you cannot be a citizen of that eternal kingdom. Now brethren, that's the case with any of these steps. It's the case of hearing, believing, repenting, and confessing in addition to baptism. But realize this, that so many people stop short. They accept the hearing, they accept the believing, they accept the repenting, and they even accept the confession. 
But they then turn around and say baptism is not necessary. It's not essential. If you want to do it, fine, but it has nothing to do with eternal life. Brethren, it has everything to do with eternal life, just as every command of God has everything to do with eternal life. Because what is it when we don't follow God's command? We sin. And brethren, that leads us to that last point. Will we walk faithfully with him? Will we move beyond a life of sin? And will we move into a life that with God's help draws us closer and closer to our Heavenly Father each and every day? Brethren, if God says do something, we do it. If he says don't do something, we don't do it. Whatever he says by his authority, we accept in submission to his will the course of our lives. And the course of our life is to resist sin, to flee from sin, to leave it behind in the waters of baptism that wash away those sins, and we rise to walk in newness of life, a life that is committed to Christ, a life that is committed to sinlessness as much as we can. Brethren, John would make the comment, don't act like you don't sin, because you do. And he said that once again to Christians, to children of God, people who are trying to make that commitment to live a life without sin, but realize we still make mistakes. We still fall short, but part of being faithful is repenting to God, asking him for forgiveness, demonstrating with the change of our life that we've learned our lesson and that we're going to strive to, to not do that ever again, and then following through by living a life for him. That's what being faithful is all about. And this morning we're surrounded by people we know, people we don't know. We're surrounded by people who are members of the body of Christ and people who have not made that decision to put on Christ in baptism. The question first and foremost is for that group of people. If you're not a Christian this morning, then what can we do to help you make that decision? What can we do to help you give your life to Christ and overcome the power of sin? If you are a child of God, are you triumphing over sin? Now, brethren, that's going to be a lifetime battle and a lifetime struggle, but it begins with a decision, the decision to leave it all behind. It begins with a decision to follow Christ, and it begins with a decision to do so more faithfully each and every day. And maybe we can help you in that way as well. Maybe there are some other struggles you're facing this morning. Maybe temptation is knocking at your door because of other things that you're facing. Maybe loved ones, family members, friends, your job, whatever. If there's some way we can help you, we want to help you and we stand ready to help you because we do not want sin to get a foothold in anyone's life. We want to beat it. We want to beat it back with the Son of God. And if we can help you to do that this morning, let us know how we can. All together, we stand.